perfect. So let's start here really quick. When Satoshi wrote the white paper, he envisioned a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash. Since that time, we've kind of gone astray. We see a cottage industry of custodial services, exchanges, promissory notes. It's an entire industry that's been built up that, in some estimations, has strayed from Satoshi's vision. The idea now is that we have custodians, exchanges, and these allow people to accumulate Bitcoin, to accumulate the crypto offspring, and to be able to do so in a fast and easy way. But many others would posit that this is actually a Faustian bargain. Easy KYC for easy Bitcoin. You give up your identity, you give up your picture, your name, your address, your personal identifying information, and you can easily stack those sats in your wallet. What does that mean? It allows the government, through court orders, legal or otherwise, to get that information and to track your Bitcoin, to track your stack. We've seen the impact of this on Bitcoin fog. We've seen the impact with donations to Russian dissident Navalny. And we've seen it recently with the Freedom Convoy. We've seen a lot of governmental institutions try to get involved and craft those rules. So this esteemed panel today will be talking about some of these issues and the practical tools and solutions that are available, that are existing, and that have thousands of contributors around the globe and great customers and consumers like us that can use them. Uh, so we'll start with you, Rai, very quickly because your theme is on cypherpunks. And not all cypherpunks agree on the utility of Bitcoin, as it were, as a chain. Some of them prefer privacy coins, privacy chains. Why do you think they disagree on that? And what should Bitcoiners consider? Well, um, um, privacy is kind of the core, uh, core methodology uh, of uh, the strategy of cypherpunks to increase their liberty. Uh, so uh, we are uh, looking at ways how to increase it uh, all the time. So it's, uh, it started way before Bitcoin. It was uh, with uh, PGP encryption, Mixmasters, Tor, and so on. Uh, so uh, it is uh, very important to uh, talk about this privacy aspect and to actually understand what is going on. Um, I have a uh, I, I have a thing that I like to explain uh, uh, to uh, uh, to for example to Monero people uh, because when they criticize uh, Bitcoin they do not understand Lightning they read some things and and they and they think that they know how it works and uh, what kind of privacy uh, it actually de delivers but I do the same thing uh, to Bitcoiners uh, because when they criticize Monero they usually don't understand it. Uh, so uh, for me, um, uh, it is th the most important thing here is to ask, okay, what is this Bitcoin? What is this electronic cash? Why do, why do we use it? Of course, most people use it to get rich fast, ideally tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, it does, doesn't work th this way and it's not so easy. And uh, the reason uh, why cypherpunks wanted electronic cash, because it was there since the beginning, since the late 80s and uh, early 90s, uh, it was in the program of crypto anarchists in, in crypto anarchy manifesto. Um, and they wanted to create uh, basically a, a parallel financial system. Uh, so Bitcoin is a core of this parallel financial system and not alt altcoins, unfortunately or fortunately, but uh, it's, it's like a language. So we all agreed uh, on, a, on a one uh, building block um, that we built this parallel financial system on. So if you think that it's a way to get rich, then maybe you can talk about uh, custodial services and something like that. I don't think it's a good idea even in this case, uh, but for uh, everyone else, if it's, a, if it's an insurance against the failure of the mainstream financial system, then you need to have self-custody and you need to buy it privately. Uh, because if you don't, uh, it doesn't protect you against uh, extortion, excessive taxation, uh, against uh, uh, all, all these things that Bitcoin is built for. So uh, the thing is uh, that non-private Bitcoin uh, has the same price, the same spot price. So if you buy it on a, uh, on a custodial exchange uh, or if you even leave it there, there are some like PayPal or Revolut, 
uh, they can they can give you like a exposure to the price, uh, but it's not in your wallet. Um, so you are paying the same price, but you don't get all the features. It's like buying a certificate uh, about owning a car that you cannot drive. The, so uh, if you uh, do just a little bit of work uh, to uh, acquire it as it was intended, privately and in your by, by holding your own keys, you will actually get a better product uh, for the same price. So Anna, I want to go on that point as well. Do you see this distinction between KYC Bitcoin and non-KYC Bitcoin? Should we make that distinction, you think? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my point is that like the whole concept behind Bitcoin is self-custody. And I think if you're not ready to take that responsibility, you just don't buy Bitcoin. Why would you need it in the first place? Absolutely. So, Marek, a question to you, General. Uh, I mean, I would like to stack like many of my colleagues and friends here, uh, but maybe I don't know the risks and dangers of KYC of giving my driver's license passport to an exchange. What is my risk if I'm doing that? Well, I think you already uh, told it very well that uh, for buying KYC coin, you are not getting the full product. It, that definitely depends on what you are trying to do, but uh, you are buying certificate and uh, not the Bitcoin itself. And uh, it's not only a problem for you as a, as a buyer, but I believe that uh, big custodians, big companies holding a lot of Bitcoins are systemic risk for uh, the project itself. So by buying and uh, uh, keeping coins uh, in KYC uh, custody solutions, you are engineering the, the, the whole project, basically. So we should uh, care about uh, non-KYC self-custody uh, ways of holding, using Bitcoin, not only for us, but, uh, not, not only for, for, the, for, the, for us, but also like for the whole stability of the project. If you will make it, uh, if, if the buying and keeping Bitcoins on exchange will be strictly easier and more accessible for normal people than, uh, than like uh, going full custody on KYC, then we are losing, losing the war. Absolutely. Uh, Anna, um, at HODL HODL, I'm sure people are, are signed up and have accounts. Uh, you're not collecting all the, the sorts of information that you would at normal crypto exchanges. Who do you think are your potential customers? Who could your customers be globally of people who would like to use a service like HODL HODL or others that won't connect, uh, collect KYC? Yeah. Uh, so basically our main volumes come from the emerging markets, uh, Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa. And those are the customers we're aiming to serve. Um, not because these regions have like highest adoption rates, uh, but just because unfortunately, in most cases, we are the only available solution for those people. and. Uh, some of them, they don't have any government-issued IDs, thus they are like excluded from the banking system, they're unserved by centralized Bitcoin exchanges and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, these people are just forced to use us. And when we say we want to bring Bitcoin to the world, we don't aim to serve like um, privileged masses as like you, me, us, uh, who have an access to all the financial tools we have to uh, who get uh, to benefit from like more or less stable economies and currencies. Uh, th yeah, those are our customers and the people who actually need us. How much do you think political repression plays into people trying to acquire Bitcoin on non-KYC uh, platforms? Is, is it something that we know sort of what's happening in Russia? We know yeah. in China. How much do you think that plays into it apart from just the developing world, but also authoritarian governments overall? Um, yeah, um, th those are our customers as well. People who suffer from th those those cases are like everywhere. Political chase, tyranny, dictatorship, and all of those people. Unfortunately, those are the people uh, who are left with the non-custodial peer-to-peer solutions like Hodl Hodl. Exactly. All right. So uh, I have a question for you, uh, Urai. There's a lot of different custodial solutions that exist. Uh, many people will make the argument that for uh, NGU, number go up. Uh, we need to have uh, certain levels of this. Um, 
what is the, the sort of argument that you usually make of the difference between non-custodial and custodial services? And do you think that custodial services have a place in Bitcoin and the larger crypto and its offspring ecosystem? You can do custody uh, in the right way. So, for example, there are uh, solutions with multi six where they kind of add uh, security, for example, or uh, make uh, make it easier for you to uh, for for uh, uh, for inheritance, for example, for inheritance purposes. So, I wouldn't say custody is the is the wrong thing. Uh, the question is if you actually have the Bitcoin. Or if it's uh, you know just uh, just a number on some some web platform, um, uh, what most people don't understand though the problem with KYC, uh, many people would uh, would say okay, I just buy it on a on a KYC exchange and then I use uh, whatever Wasabi or even Trezor Lounge the the, the coin join solution. And I will, I will basically clean the coins uh, um, in my in my wallet and uh, kind of get rid of the history. Uh, so what is most important is not uh, how the Bitcoin is stored, what address, what what UTXO. The most important thing is uh, that you created this permanent record. It doesn't matter what you do with with it on chain. You know you can swap it to different chain and back. You can put it on Lightning, which has really good privacy. Uh, but the problem is that the exchange has the record of your name and the date and the amount uh, you bought Bitcoin for. So um, if we are using it, for example, as protection uh, in case of failure of financial system or some state repression, the exchange gave probably uh, some of them give this information and certainly on request uh, that you bought uh, this amount of Bitcoin at this time and then they can come uh, to you and then they say, okay, either you still have it, show us the key, sign, it, sign uh, a message that you still own it, or you have sold it and tell us how you text it, you know? <laughs> and it doesn't matter, you can do whatever uh, coin join, privacy, magic. Uh, so uh, don't imagine it as, uh, you know, some KYC tech attached to your coins traveling uh, on, on, the, on the Bitcoin time chain. Uh, but think about the records that you create with the exchange and the exchange is in many cases forced to report this to certain uh, institutions, not only governments, but uh, also governments. So, so you're saying if I happen to have a boating accident, lose my keys, it doesn't matter because there's still the record of me purchasing yes. Bitcoin at a particular time and that yes. could follow me. And whether it be a government order, legal order, that could come back to bite me. Yes, and I'm very skeptical about the story of the boating accident. People say that they're going to tell this story, but when there's there are two policemen with guns and uh, handcuffs, most people will not tell the story about the boating accident, um, especially if they did not report it when it happened. You know, I lost my coins, and you know, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I was scuba stolen, diving all the same. So, yeah. All right, so. Uh, Marek, you, you uh, have been in uh, Bitcoin uh, for a long time. You oversee many different projects, tools, platforms. Uh, what are some everyday tools or platforms that people can use? We've heard a lot about Vexel throughout this conference. We know things like RoboSats, HODL, HODL. What, what are some other uh, tools or platforms that people can use if they would like to get into the actual non-KYC lifestyle of Bitcoin? Yeah. I have been uh, one of the first users on uh, localbitcoins.com yep. back back in the days. I know founders, and I believe that they they intended uh, to have the platform as a way to uh, get non KYC uh, coins, non custodial, and make make it affordable for for people. Uh, easy platform, unfortunately, uh, and it's uh, uh, is the way where any centralized service will end in the way is that they have been forced to add KYC, uh, KYC uh, checks in the platform. And I think it's uh, less than one year when they closed the platform. Okay. And um, I see this, and I saw this as a huge risk in the future. And uh, from my op opinion, all the platforms has some drawbacks when it comes uh, for uh, sustainability or privacy or like um, 
KYC and, and so on. And that's, that's basically the reason why we founded Vexor. And uh, we started to work uh, on it one and a half year back. And it was like more uh, in, in case uh, something bad will happen, we will have a platform which will be ready. And I believe that even in, in this period of one and a half year, the situation uh, with the privacy and, uh, and all the regulations is going much faster than I anticipated. So uh, the project which we started uh, is uh, in case is already very actual nowadays. And uh, Anna uh, told, uh, told that uh, their, uh, their customers are from countries uh, of, uh, of some uh, dictatorships and so on. And uh, as you can check the financial tyranny index, which, uh, which um, uh, Lea uh, introduced uh, yesterday, actually, uh, the West countries are not that free as we want to still uh, see or uh, how, how we see them. So uh, there are some tools, but I think they all have the drawbacks. And I believe the Vexel is unique in the way that it's uh, the new kit on the on the block, which doesn't uh, leave any any traces of the actual trade. So no matter what will happen in ten years from now, but uh, we introduce the tool which doesn't uh, uh, which which uh, that doesn't uh, hurt you in the future if something wrong happen with the government with with the world we are living in. Absolutely, and I, I, I'm very jealous of many of my Czech friends that have had this installed for a long time. I'm, I'm switching between app stores to try to figure out how I can get it. something that's good. Uh, I know uh, you talked before about the importance of, of self-custody, because obviously you're able to get your Bitcoin, you're not giving up your ID, you're not giving the name of your firstborn child, and you're able to finally have access to those sats. Uh, when it comes to self-custody today, are, do you think you're you're satisfied with the self-custody options, do you think that enough exists out there for every type of Bitcoiner, or has it gotten too complicated, or are there are always improvements we could make? I would say we have enough solutions in the, within the market already. I mean, if you're a hardcore Bitcoiner, get yourself a hardware wallet and just buy your Bitcoin peer-to-peer, -peer, anonymously have it on the hardware wallet, and you're safe, basically. But yeah, there are another reliable solutions like open source trusted uh, Bitcoin wallets like Electrum, Wasabi and all of these wallets like preserve our privacy. So it's just a matter of choice. You can, yeah, if you can afford yourself and if you're ready to take that responsibility, uh, you should probably get yourself a hardware wallet. But if you want to take it like easier, just, uh, yeah, use solutions that are available for desktop, mobile, uh, just choose wisely. And since you're at Hado Hado, a question I always have is, uh, I'd love to buy peer-to-peer -peer more. I'm an average Bitcoiner. Uh, how do I know there are always going to be people selling it to me? Is it, how do we know there, there's always going to be a market? Or do you think that there's enough of a uh, sort of exchange in that people are always willing to sell their Bitcoin and people are always willing to buy it? I just wonder if we'll ever get to a point where there's plenty of buyers in the room, but there aren't enough sellers. And what will yeah. that mean for price and et cetera? Yeah, I get the point, but with the peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, it's easy because you basically create the liquidity. You're the market maker. So just put up your offers, uh, distribute them, share those, uh, and yeah, wait until someone accepts it. There you go. It's as simple as easy. <laughs> it we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll put out a couple bids uh, today in the afternoon. We'll see if you guys do it. Uh, Yura, I have a, a question. I wanted to talk about uh, some of the some of the tools that you use, and uh, Matic mentioned some of them. Are there any other platforms, tools, practices that that you think are are good for privacy for for some of them who might not be in uh, cypherpunk world for a long time, maybe who've just gotten into this? Uh, what is something that they can do very easily starting off? Uh, I think one of the underrated tools uh, is uh, proxy merchants. So that would be things like Bitrefill, coin cards, and uh, many other services where you uh, don't necessarily uh, spend your Bitcoin for fiat, but uh, for fiat denominated services. 
so uh, for example, uh, in many countries, you can refill your phone or buy an Amazon gift card. Uh, I top up my Uber account uh, like this. So it's a way to uh, gain access to the wider economy and Bitrefill is basically a proxy merchant. Why I think this is important in the cypherpunk world is that uh, uh, CBDCs are coming and we might not be able to use cash for much longer. Uh, I don't want to cause panic, but maybe in 10 years there would be in, in the West at least no such thing as cash. Uh, and many pe uh, people say, okay, that's the end for peer-to-peer. -peer. Now everything is going to be tracked. Uh, but no, uh, if there is a market opportunity for people to uh, be in the middle, take your Bitcoin and give you what you want, um, and these are called pro proxy merchants, um, then we are still able to uh, to use our, our coins anonymously. So this is uh, very underrated and very useful. Uh, uh, something that is also very useful is Lightning, uh, uh, also uh, with uh, with uh, these peer-to-peer -peer trades. Uh, so uh, uh, Vexel trades, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the main idea how to use Vexel is to meet physically in person. Um, and uh, uh, when you do the trade, you don't want to wait for the confirmation. So uh, either like uh, the, the uh, wallet provider uh, creates a turbo channel, but it basically it's immediate and there is no history. So you don't have to worry where the coins were before. So so Lightning for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, trading is actually, uh, I think, the, the, the best use case. You know, you don't need to wait uh, for anything. Uh, don't You don't need to think about the, the fees. Um, also, uh, when, when you think about this, it, it relates to user experience. So with both HODL, HODL, like people say, you know, these KYC exchanges, they have better user experience. But the question is, is, is this really the case? Uh, because first of all, you don't, uh, you don't need to show your face to neither HODL, HODL or Vexel. Um, and, and your documents and everything, this approval process is super user unfriendly. It's like uh, if, if your experience starts with this, then, then you're already lost. Uh, but then uh, the things that are happening uh, are things like uh, closed bank accounts. You know, you receive a wire, it happened to me actually, I received a wire from Kraken or something like that and my bank just wrote me a letter, sorry, we cannot do business with you. So what kind of a user experience is this? Um, so I would, I would like to uh, kind of shift the framing uh, and, and say, okay, this is actually easier and better user experience. Uh, in case of Bexel, you are actually meeting a Bitcoiner. So you can ask, okay, uh, I'm new to this. Uh, you are selling me Bitcoin. You know, what wallet should I use? You know, wh how should I store it? What, uh, like, what is this seed phrase? Or, you know, what should I show you? And, and you are talking to a real person. Uh, so it's not only about buying Bitcoin, but about, uh, uh, about, uh, the interaction and the the uh, the experience with a real human being who can I certainly like send a Bitcoin transaction. So it's a tool uh, as well, but not only for trading, but it's a, a really good onboarding tool, uh, I believe. So that's I, I another tool. That. I, I think that's. I was actually in preparation for this panel. I used uh, RoboSats uh, just to you know obviously try it out again. And my trade partner told me, um, "Come to BTC Prague." So I don't know who you are. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the sats and thank you for the message and I made it. Um, Anna, if you were to give uh, sort of a one good piece of advice for people's Bitcoin hygiene, uh, what kind of advice would you offer to someone? Mm, holding your own keys, obviously. Using non-custodial solutions for whether it's trading, lending, whatever this is, just choose non-custodial solutions every time you get to interact with Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. That's probably the most important point. I, yeah, I think that speaks for itself. And as you mentioned, there are so many options uh, that people can use. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention uh, when it comes to acquiring Bitcoin non-KYC is mining. And um, obviously, you're Europeans. You know, at a, an American conference, you'd have the big miners on stage talking about this and getting all of that. So, Marek, you're a big entrepreneur in the space. Uh, what, you know, do we talk about mining enough in Europe? Do you think it's something that we, we should perhaps discuss a lot more? Or do you think a lot of right now the entrepreneurial endeavors are, are mostly elsewhere in the U.S. or other countries? I think mining is tough business nowadays. 
and with the energy prices here in Europe, uh, I don't really believe that he can do this like for profit in some significant way on, on like small scale. And uh, of course, if you consider it as a way how to get non-KYC coins, and you don't care that much about about the about the price, I think it's definitely like a legit legit way, not not the easiest. I think so, still like meeting with friends and buying from them is much easier. Much much easier, much more fun. Uh, that that's the way to interact. I've done this too many times in Prague cafes and stuff, and. Uh, Spent a lot of early sats at Paranipolis, so that's, uh, that's, that's the way it should be. Um, one question I had for you, Anna, as well, is about just the peer-to-peer -peer, um, question of Bitcoin. A lot of people have accumulated Bitcoin, they've stacked, they've got it in their hardware wallets, and there it stays. Uh, what are some of the things that you've seen in terms of trends for a peer-to-peer -peer economy? Are, are you hopeful... Obviously, we're at a conference where you can spend Bitcoin right now. You can get a beer, coffee, you can get a T-shirt. You know, where do you think it goes from here? Mm, I would say there are still a plenty of use cases for peer-to-peer, -peer, at least stacking sats reg like on a regular basis through peer-to-peer. -peer, and you don't need centralized exchanges to do it. You basically don't need anyone. It's like... Uh, as soon as you grasp the understanding of Bitcoin, you understand this immediately that you basically don't need anyone um, because like, none of us owns a Bitcoin and it's not stored anywhere and it's not owned by anyone who's supposed to be distributing in a centralized manner. Uh, so basically Bitcoin is a public data ledger and yeah, all we do is like transfer the ownership, uh, the, access, the access to the certain amount of coins. And if basically I have a uh, private key to access the certain amount uh, of Bitcoin, why would I need a centralized authority to pass this ownership on my behalf? Uh, that, that's my point, that basically you can interact with people on a peer-to-peer -peer basis for everything that's basically possible. And you need, don't need a middle party, you don't need a third party, because as, like, with the lesson we've learned from the recent market conditions, well, I hope we finally learned that lesson that uh, third parties are security holes. Oh, I yeah, very true. <laughs> We've had too many third parties that have gotten too involved in uh, a lot of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, so for you, Marek, as well, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer economy, how do you see it developing? Are people spending enough Bitcoin? Are they using it between each other? Or do you think people are still in HODL mode? Yeah. It's a hard question because unless as people income in Bitcoin, I don't think it makes sense to spend a Bitcoin that much. It changed like for me personally because I have income in Bitcoin, so I'm easy with spending Bitcoin because I'm using it as a, as a, as a currency, basically. So we definitely have, uh, we definitely need more places, more ways how to work for Bitcoin, to have uh, companies paying, uh, paying um, people in Bitcoin. So this uh, mindset is changing. When, when you are earning uh, fiat, it doesn't make sense to spend uh, Bitcoin that much. But I think definitely here in Czech, uh, here in Prague, there are companies uh, which can pay you in Bitcoin. It's easy. Uh, it's, it's getting more easy, definitely, in Bitcoin companies. Uh, and there are a few of them in, in Prague. This is like kind of normal. And I think this is like changing uh, the mentality of people as well. Uh, of course, uh, back in days uh, in in Paralini Polis, uh, when uh, when people were buying beer and not uh, buying uh, for Bitcoin and not buying Bitcoins uh, back, um, I think now it's one of the most expensive beers in history. Yeah. So when you are spending Bitcoins and you don't have uh, income in Bitcoin, definitely buy back a Bitcoin. Spend and replace. As yes. It were. Spend yes. and replace. Yeah. Maybe I would add something. Spend and replace is a good strategy, of course. Uh, but uh, how do you think about this philosophically? So uh, what is money? What is the transaction? Like if uh, Marek or Anna does something good for me, uh, solves my problems, uh, sells me something, it, it is a way to say thank you. To, to, you, know, uh, you create this entry. My friend uh, uh, Juraj Karpic, who is an Austrian economist, he says that uh, money is a memory of good deeds of society. And when I know that they are Bitcoiners, 
why would I say thank you with fiat? You know, I know they will appreciate Bitcoin more. So I uh, should not be solving my shitcoin problem. You know, I have too much fiat. Okay, I have a shitcoin problem, and I want to get rid of it. But let's Sorry sell to it that. to people who want who want the fiat uh, in exchange for Bitcoin, and then use it. You know, because it's just much nicer. It doesn't cost more. You know, they will not charge more. Usually, they will charge less if I pay, pay in Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, but when I when I want to be nice to them, it's the same cost to me, and I'm much nicer to Bitcoiners. And I, I and I say I appreciate. Thank you for solving my problem. So I I think it's a be much better attitude than uh, solving your shitcoin problems by dumping uh, uh, you know fiat shitcoins on people yeah. Yeah. who okay. would like something else. How, how many people here have a shitcoin problem? Do we have <laughs> Oh, one. I'm All sorry time, to hear yeah. that, fella. We'll, we'll get an ambulance here very quick. Uh, so, uh, Anna, on, on that kind of note, uh, when it comes to spending Bitcoin, using Bitcoin, is, is it something that uh, you see that people are actually much more open to now, now that they're able to acquire it non-KYC, not having to worry as much? Or do you think that people are still a bit apprehensive? I would say it depends mostly on the region, on the situations and stuff. Of course, the concept of spending Bitcoin is easier explained to someone coming from Islamic State, I don't know, or China, Russia or Ukraine, because these people are just, yeah, they, they, they understand, they grasp it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, um, I'm coming from Europe and unfortunately in the place where I live, people are not so open to accept Bitcoin and everything. They're just not ready to understand it yet. But I also understand that we are early in the space and it all takes education and time and that's what we are doing. That's one step at a time. I guess it depends. Uh, uh, Marek, you know, you're here in Prague in the Czech Republic. Do you think that there's a particular European sort of uh, mantra behind the, the sort of peer-to-peer -peer economy and why it has, has grown so extensively on the European continent when you compare it to the American model? And I'm sorry, I keep... Comparing, but do you see that there's a bit of a difference in the European mantra? I don't know if it's because Europe is more decentralized, because there's been centuries, as we've heard from uh, Rahim, of trade between different cultures. Do you think that adds to it a little bit? I'm. I can compare Europe and America. I can uh, compare uh, Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia and the rest of the Europe. Uh, I believe that Czech and Slovak people are more likely to. Uh, like uh, un understand Bitcoin and go peer to peer because we had some experience, political experience, and uh, I'm too young to remember like myself the, the communist era and so on. But it's still in the DNA. Like I heard it from a family, so so I I had some um, understanding for it. So and I really believe that Czech and Slovak people are more. Uh, like decentralized in the nature compared in uh, I spoke to that uh, people in Germany doesn't understand it that much okay. so so I think it's really local uh, local thing that uh, the peer-to-peer -peer and uh, Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin uh, Bitcoiners um, are on the rise here uh, so so much than in the rest of the uh, rest of the Europe but of course I think it's like current like globally that it's it's okay. on the rise. So, uh, Anna, would you agree with that? Sort of the, the communist experience, not a good theme park ride at all. But do you think that is, is something that has perhaps shifted the mentality of many Europeans towards adopting Bitcoin in some areas? Yes, I would say so, yeah. yeah. Yes. You would I say, man. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, it sucks that many countries and citizens had to go through that and generations... Uh, but I think the counterculture definitely is pushing against it, and Bitcoin is a part of that. Um, so for today's generation, for those who are at the conference today, uh, they're going to have their brains filled up with all kinds of ideas and platforms and services, and their phones are going to die from all these apps they're installing. Uh, but, you know, if there's one big takeaway they can, they can take from this panel, from your conversations, what would you like to offer to the average participant? The, the hardcore people, they're on your side. They've already signed up and they follow you on Noster and Twitter and everything else. But for those who might just be coming to their first conference or first event, what's that piece of actionable advice that you can give them? And we'll start with uh, Mari. Yeah. Well, first step is it's better to have Bitcoin than 
don't have a Bitcoin. So if you are scared of this uh, this peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer tools and and so on that you can screw up, it's still better to have KYC than don't have because when you have Bitcoin, you can do something later later on when you uh, learn enough and you get uh, more confidence in in all all the stuff. But of course, like our mission is to make the self custodial and non KYC so easy so you don't need to be scared scared of it so it's both like a, it's like a Satoshi's vision and it's uh, embodied in Trezor and now Vexel so that's our mission to uh, provide tools so you don't need to be scared i'm not scared right now but we'll go with that <laughs> yes anna i will let you go mademoiselle your turn um, yeah, uh, my first advice would be to get yourself a self-custodial wallet, preferably a hard wallet, but again, depends on your needs. Uh, yeah, and just make sure to uh, take your privacy seriously and start doing it today uh, because, yeah, privacy is easily lost and normally it's hard to restore. So use non-custodial, uh, anonymous, KYC-free solutions for buying Bitcoin. Perfect. Yuri? I would just add to this. I agree. That would be my first advice. Uh, I would point to the uh, white paper which says peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And uh, I consider uh, Bitcoin to be also a social network and a way to try peer-to-peer -peer interactions with people. So many of you are employed, uh, which is a hierarchy. Many of you uh, still believe in politics and uh, some kind of hierarchical systems. And when you interact with Bitcoiners, not all of them, but many of them are trying out these peer-to-peer -peer interactions, which is what, uh, what the Cypherpunk is also about. So uh, while you are doing this self-custody, private way of acquiring, uh, maybe using Vexel, as a, because it's basically a dating site for, <laughs> for trades, you know, it's a, it's a social network. Uh, maybe uh, maybe ask people how they live and if they if you can kind of go a little bit further and uh, uh, switch from the uh, hierarchical dominance mindset uh, into into more peer-to-peer -peer relations uh, with uh, relationships with other humans uh, and uh, bitcoiners is a good community to start with this experience that's perfect well we heard from the peanut gallery uh, apparently about uh, Trezor and implementing coin joins, so we might as well uh, ask that question. Uh, thank you, sir, after you've had your breakfast. Um, so we didn't really talk about coin join. We didn't talk about that too much throughout the panel, but uh, Marek, if you could just give sort of a, a quick idea of, of why you think that is something that is important to implement in some hardware wallets. Yeah, well, definitely. Coin join doesn't solve your KYC issues, as, uh, as um, uh, Yura mentioned on the beginning. But definitely CoinJoin is an uh, interesting uh, tool for managing who sees your balance, who sees your transaction when you are interacting with people. And uh, until recently, it was like hard to manage it uh, like in a, in a sa safe way, like um, um, uh, do the CoinJoin in a safe way because all uh, the implement CoinJoin implementations uh, has been uh, like software wallets. And uh, we decided to uh, push push uh, the security uh, further with implementing the conjoint directly in the hardware. So now you don't need to make a compro compromise and uh, choose in between privacy and security because you can uh, do the mixing itself in, in, in the hardware. It was like a tough engineering challenge. It took a few years of designing and engineering, but we are here and it, it works. So basically, it doesn't solve uh, KYC, so we, uh, I think it's a bit, uh, bit different topic than, than uh, like on the KYC panel, but it's still important thing uh, because uh, nowadays uh, Bitcoin blockchain is completely transparent. So if you are uh, using it for uh, some uh, paying for a mer merchant and so on, he can do some, uh, some analysis and see your balance and, and so on. And it's uh, it's definitely not not nice. So we are uh, providing the tools to to hide this and improve your privacy, basically. 
Okay, I am glad I didn't have to moderate the coin join war panel, but it's fine. We'll start here. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll top it off here at the very end. I know we're at wrapping up, but your favorite service or product that you've purchased with Bitcoin, give us hope. You know, what, what's your kind of favorite thing you've been able to buy, service, product, good or otherwise? Yuri, we'll start with you. Uh, I bought a vaporizer for wheat for Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Nice little PAX device. Okay. Good. Yes. Thanks. Anna, your turn. I, I, I guess this he might sell you a better version. I'm not sure. So, Anna, you? I think it's a hardware wallet, I guess. There you go. Yeah. First one. Yeah. Marek, for you, I'm not sure. Since you get paid in Bitcoin and stuff, I'm sure it's like groceries, well, but... I I don't think that I have a like favorite product. I I personally use Bitcoin as much as possible everywhere. So I'm buying anything with Bitcoin when when it's possible. And my probably the, my purchase with I uh, what I remember till today is definitely alpaca socks back in 2011. There you go. Very wow. good. Okay. Very good socks. Oh, all right. Well, I think it was a good discussion and debate. Obviously, um, both all of you are representing sort of different products, services, or educational services. So be sure uh, Yuri's books, you pick those up. Use HODL HODL. Get yourself Trezor. Use all the different services that Marek is involved in. I want to thank you guys for discussing it, talking about it. Peanut gallery crowd overall. Uh, it's been fun. So thank you all for listening. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank, thank you. you.